I have never met a girl who turned around and said, well, I don't want to go to school. I want to be married as a child or I want to do the housework or I want to take the goats out for grazing. I think what really becomes critical is the external factors that are actually impacting motivation for children, especially in areas where, where I work. Um, you know, in rural and tribal communities, it's the, the thinking is that a goat is an asset and a girl is a liability. What's the point of sending her to school? And you're actually finding that it's the external factors that are actually suppressing and crushing that child's motivation. Um, and th those are some of the pieces that we really focus on, is to say, how do we remove those particular barriers? It's the crucial variable in education, how to keep children motivated and that they stay in school and continue learning to learn. Motivation is key for studying. You know, you, ha you have to be motivated to continue your studies. I don't think it's an issue of demotivation. I just think that now teachers or if you want to say the educational system just don't know what buttons to press to make the learner motivated. We had to challenge the conventional way of learning of uh, teacher-centered instruction to the principles we know from 100 years ago. Active participation, student engagement, flexibility, not everybody learns the same thing at the same time. Uh, give them time, everybody can learn. Um, relevance that anything you learn uh, can be applied with your parents and your community as we saw in the, in the videos we saw. Um, empathy and cooperative learning, you know, you learn through dialogue and interaction. I mean, you're constructing knowledge. We have to give feedback during the process, not at the end when it's too late. So I think that's the crucial part. And if, you, if your role is not transmitting information, but making the right intelligent questions, stimulating, motivating during the process, I think that is the best thing. Unless teachers themselves are exposed to this type of training when they are being trained, how can we, you know, they cannot make the change. So we had to transform all these variables and all this complexity into very simple, manageable actions so that any teacher in any part of the world without having a PhD could transform their pedagogy. And this is something that teachers can have control of. I think that parents obviously have a very, very important role. I mean, I have children, you have children, and we see parents are such an active part of, um, you know, educating your child. What, in the communities where we work, the difficulty is that most of my children are first-generation learners. They have no history of schooling in their family. So their parents don't really have the capacity like we do. I mean, it's like if my child was learning Japanese, I don't know if she's doing a PhD or if she's just learning the alphabet. They are not really able to engage in that way. So we've actually created certain tools for parents to get involved. Um, we have these school assessment charts for a parent to really know what is a good school and what is a bad school. The school that my child goes to, is it a good school? Um, and these assessment charts are actually visual uh, with the traffic light, red, orange, and green kind of rating that parents can do themselves. So we're actually trying to find these other ways in which we can engage parents actively into the school system. What tactics and strategies do you employ? We had to create champions for girls, but from the same gender gap villages, and that was first and foremost the most crucial piece. So we find young people, 18 to 25, who are literate themselves, uh, train them 12 days a year for three years, so it's fairly intense, mentor them. And with that kind of help and support, that volunteer is finding every single girl, you know, going door to door, mapping out who's out of school. And then they're actually talking to parents. And because they are from that village, they're tapping into a lot of local networks, picking local examples, um, going back again and again and again and really creating that conversation, getting the village leadership involved, so getting other stakeholders involved. And actually that's what really helps to create change um, over a period of time. In the past, say, five, 10 years, women have, because of their limitations, they can't go travel, they can't do it. They sought their freedom through their education. So they went to schools, they went to universities, they went and got their master's degrees. And some of them now, they all travel abroad and they go get their master's and doctorates and are professors and or experts in their fields. Whereas, you know, I feel that the, the men in our society, and maybe this is a generalization, but are very demotivated because of, you know, the, how, how the population or society views education. My uncles were the same, you know, in terms of like, 
you know, oh, I'm going to study in school, but then, like, I'm done. I'm going to go get a job. After a couple of years working, they realized, wait, I should have gone to college. And some of them did go back, and they went, and they got their degree. Why? Because they realized that it's not the system that is important. You know, I have to memorize, I have to memorize. It's the knowledge and things they learn and how they implement it in their personal life, in their in their a professional life and their academic life because it it makes them wiser it makes them more knowledgeable and that that i think is the most important to have the freedom to make mistakes learn from your mistakes grow and pass that on if anything you learn can be applied to the family your self esteem comes up so these are the 21st century skills everybody's talking about which is learning to learn learning to take initiatives learning to work in teams and these are the essentials for continuous learning. So if you touch on these variables, going beyond just cognitive achievement, also social-emotional dimensions. By the way, we're measuring all these social skills now because we feel that they're so important for academic achievement. Training is the start of the conversation. You know, the behavior change, because our volunteers are actually going into the classroom three times a week over three years, using puzzles, games, the creative activities to change the atmosphere that it has to be over a period of time. The three-day training of diets and teachers is not going to change it. But you have to use it as a process. But when you do that, I mean, the Pali district was the first district where we started working. It's not a small district. 1,067 villages, quarter of a million children. It is no longer a gender gap district. So you can't have a single strategy when things are so broken. You have to look at comprehensive solutions, and then you will actually see an equilibrium shift. When young people are physically, socially, emotionally, and intellectually engaged, they are happy, and you have them. You have 100% of the child um, in front of you. You don't have to worry about motivation anymore. It's all about the relationship, and you've got to get that right. And if the teacher feels they haven't got it right, sit down with the kids and sort it out. Because if you can't sort that out, no learning will take place. It is a whole ecosystem. It's not just about the child or the teacher, that there's so many other factors around it. So cultural, systemic, you know, the classroom interaction, all of it really needs to come together. And it can, and change can happen. And you can actually find those allies anywhere. We find them in, in young, uh, you know, literate people in, in critical gender gap villages. Um, and it is possible, you know, they have brought back 80,000 girls back into the school system who weren't previously. They've convinced parents. So we can see that change, but we have to look at the entire ecosystem to really enable that child's motivation to bloom. It's not anymore that we don't know what to do or that we don't know how to do it. It's that it's not being done consistently and coherently. And to me, the key answer is if you want young people to grow up to be creative, what happens in the classroom has to change. And for that, the teacher has to change. Around 80% of total education budgets in the world go on teacher salaries. That's what it's spent on. It's the biggest asset we have. And we simply do not invest the money in developing them in the way that those teachers actually deserve. Thank you.